Hello, my name is Andrew Miller, Principal SE with Pure Storage. Here at Pure, we thought deeply about modern infrastructure stacks and about what matters to our customers, what their life is like from a day zero, a day one, day two perspective. And after all, this is where I started as a customer, data center admin, architect, and engineer. So let's start with day zero. This is where we're thinking about architecture. We're thinking about flexibility. We're thinking about scalability. We're sometimes thinking about, can I actually plan out what I need five years from now and I take my best guess at it and put it on a PowerPoint and we all agree that it's true, hopefully. But maybe we get penalized for dreaming too small, maybe for dreaming too big. This is of course also where, you know, when I talk with my friends who are VCDXs, they think about design constraints and what needs to happen in that and the limits that there can be. Now, hopefully day zero happens before the purchase. Not always. Sometimes you're given a large bucket of stuff. You have to make it work. It's part of a big contract. After that, of course, comes day one. Day one, we're thinking about implementation. We're thinking about setting it up. Now, sometimes you can actually get a little bit of a feel for what day one is like during day zero by asking for a POC, a proof of concept or a demo, and you see if people are willing to do that. Now, a lot of times for me, uh, sometimes we'd see that, you know, I wouldn't actually want to demo something. I would happily whiteboard it. And that can be a clue for you about how simple the solution is or not. Now, at times also in day one, we will sometimes need professional services to kind of mask that complexity that is in day one. However, it's not just day one. It's also day 180, day 365. Whenever you have to substantially re-architect or expand the infrastructure, you kind of repay that day one tax. And of course, we're at net finally into day two. And this is operate and optimize. This is the area that a lot of us live in, that we have lived in, but CIOs often don't care about this. They pay people to care about these things for them so they don't have to, except in two main areas. One, if so much of their team's time is spent on keeping the lights on, the classic 80% of the time keeping the lights on and only 20% actually driving innovation, if that slows down innovation velocity enough, then they care about day two, as well as, of course, if exchange goes down or insert your primary business application goes down or has performance issues, then we start to care about day two a lot. So as Pure, we've thought about day zero, day one, day two, both from a pure storage standpoint, you can find lots about that online, but also from an infrastructure stack perspective. So when we look at infrastructure stacks, you know, this is where I started maybe, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, give or take. We start with storage, compute, and virtualization. Of course, virtualization was the big driver here, right? If you don't still feel a little bit of awe when you see a vMotion happen and it doesn't even drop any packets as the VM moves between servers, right? We, we all try to keep our technical souls a little bit, I think. But VMware and virtualization was so successful that it created its own set of problems in that there was enough complexity here, just given how much of it there was, that people wanted more simplicity, right? We're always after simplicity. So this is where then we moved into a land of reference architectures. Let's give credit where it's due. NetApp started this with the FlexPod approach. Many other companies followed. And this is where you take, instead of having the unlimited options and possibilities down here, you start to loosely couple the pieces. You trade off some of the possibilities. You have long design docs and guides that tell you and assure you that things will work well from a day one perspective. They'll be easy enough to operate. There won't be gotchas that you're not thinking of. However, that, the trend didn't stop there. It continued moving into converged infrastructure. And again, let's give credit where it's due. This was heavily a company called you know, VCE, right? And VCE said, we are going to take all the exact same products and converged infrastructure trend, and not just VCE, but other ones as well. And we are going to artificially heavily limit the amount of possibilities and options that we choose to let you do with those products in the pursuit of making things a lot easier for day one and day two. Doing this via, you know, something like a configuration site guide that, you know, you map out an LCS, everything beforehand, before the gear even hits the floor of what, how you're gonna set it up. Or that afterwards, you know, you have release compatibility matrices. And these say, you need to be on these certain versions in lockstep across the whole stack, but hopefully that makes it easier to upgrade. Although it was still all the same pieces and sometimes upgrades could go sideways, right? But what we started to sacrifice here sometimes was the flexibility of the individual units here, the disaggregated flexibility. The interesting part is that's what heavily led us into HCI. And HCI is where the, gen, the hyperscalers started to influence the enterprise data center, which is fascinating. This is all the same enterprise equipment. So with HCI, 
You take the storage layer, you know, you turn it into a piece of software on individual servers. You have storage, compute, virtualization. These are tightly coupled, and you scale these out. And the way that you do it is you linearly scale, right? If you add one type of resource, you're by definition adding the other ones in lockstep. That's phenomenal if that's an easy process for you. It's also phenomenal if your application grows like that. But it does mean that you've given away the ability to independently scale the components. And even when HCI, in some cases, tries to make that more flexible, the design center is still around this linear scaling. So when we look at HCI, there's the tight coupling here. But the hyperscalers have even moved away from this approach. I had a friend who used to work at Google on the Colossus file system. That's the Gen 2 file system where it took over from GFS, Google File System, and is where actually Google started to independently scale and the other hyperscalers independently scale compute separately from storage. And this gets into the idea that sometimes the life cycle of compute is different than the life cycle of storage, right? We know these things. As well, I even saw this when I was on the VCE Partner Advisor Technical Council for several years. And we see the factors and what customers are wrestling with and the rise of CI and the rise of HCI and what we we're trying to accomplish. So really, what we're trying to accomplish as customers, what we're trying to do is we are in pursuit of simplicity, right? The business is coming to us and they are asking for applications and they're asking for the easiest way to deploy them. They're asking us to do it in a way that works well from a day zero perspective, from a day one implementation perspective that's easy to operate and optimize. Now there's one thing I like to think about here, almost a bit of alternate history. Historically, a lot of the complexity in these infrastructure stacks was in the storage layer. Here's some fun food for thought. What if the storage layer had been dramatically simplified 10 years ago, like what Pure has done, for instance? I'd actually argue that if that had happened, the way that CI and HCI played out over the last 10 years would have been very different. At Pure, as we've looked at this landscape, we've tried to think about what matters for you, what your life is like, what my life used to be like, and where we've gone from an industry standpoint in solving for these problems and not having just recency bias, where we're going and just looking what's out in the landscape, but pulling it back to your requirements, what your life is like. With that, we've created FlashStack. So three key benefits, because I'm not gonna talk in depth about what FlashStack is. You can find more of that on flashstack.com by reaching out to your local pure sales team. The first is around dramatically simplifying the storage layer. Storage often has been the most complex piece in these stacks. And by dramatically simplifying, it greatly reduces the day-to-day -day management. And also, if you can get to the point where you don't have forklift upgrades, then you can pay as you grow. Not do what I used to do, which is we try and figure out and put our hand in the air and say, how much do we need in three years or five years? And we take a guess at it, knowing that we're going to guess too big or too small, but we we'll take our best shot at it, removing that risk by giving the ability to pay as you grow. Secondly, the ability to consolidate more than you might, where you might have had stove pipes or application silos, the underlying infrastructure allowing you to consolidate non-uniform or disparate workloads. And third, doing this with best of breed products without continuing focusing on innovation. When, once you go into an application platform or a stack, you're making a large investment and a commitment to the future from a skill set perspective, from what's actually on the floor perspective, the dollars spent. And so this is a big deal. So do it, building this solution, FlashStack, with best of breed solutions that have a demonstrated pattern of continuing innovation. I hope this has been helpful for you. This is some of what I've lived, but even if you're not a pure customer, this helps you think through what matters, you know, even if you're not living each piece of this every day, but what might, might matter for you in a week or a year, and the, how the industry has tried to solve this, and what we, we've taken into account as we built the FlashStack solution. Thank you.